We cannot lead the way we were led. We cannot parent the way we were parented. We cannot do it. Our guest for this episode is technically if reality check was a person. You know the worst one of them all? The last one, unconscious incompetence. You are a fool, a mumu, and you don't know you are a mumu. Dr. Wale Akinyemi is a published author with 22 books on leadership and transformation to his credit. And today we get to see through decades of tried and tested life hacks from productivity to self-awareness and more. Wherever you want to go and wherever you want to get to is not a function of I, I, I desire. Desire is cheap. Wishes are cheap. It is. Dr. Wale Akinyemi is a widely read newspaper columnist in East Africa and he is also the founder of Street University where young people, young entrepreneurs are being trained, funded and launched into their dreams. So I wanted to start an institution that will teach the economics but will spend so much time on the mindset. You also have to appreciate Dr. Wale's perspective and thoughts on the crisis Kenya is facing right now. The Stone Age did not end because the world ran out of stones. <laughs> okay? Yes. <laughs> the Stone Age ended because thinking overtook stones. I'm Dr. Kingori, and here's another reason to subscribe to our channel. Come on, how just subscribe? Now's a good time to hit subscribe and turn on the notifications bell. Yeah. Uh, the article you shared with me, mm -hmm. I was very interested in uh, if the church does not do something now, maybe the priesthood should change. Mm -hmm. Is this like um, a system that gets changed uh, time and again? Like what, uh, please tell us something about priesthood. How does it come about? And what's, what's the role we expect it to mm -hmm. play, especially under the circumstances we are facing as a country? Well, throughout scripture and throughout history, Yes you find out that for every season, yes. there is a person or group of people that, you know, will be right there, that, mm. you know, they're the voices. But for some reason, after a while, they get so sucked up in their own stuff, and then another priesthood, another set of people, another mm. person is raised. So you saw that with... Uh, Saul was the anointed king mm -hmm. um, because he did not obey yes, what yes, God yes. wanted. Then what happened? David was raised up. You had Eli was the priest, you know, and um, he did not you know, control his children and all that. It was a really bad regime. Mm. And what happened? Samuel was raised up. And so we see that replacement pattern over and over and over. Um, we see, and unfortunately, you know, we even see it where ministry is concerned. We see it where, you know, there are times when somebody is a voice. Mm -hmm. And after a period, you know, that they voice is away. no more there. Yes, yes, yes. You know, um, you had uh, Zachariah, who was the, the voice, and then, you know, his voice was taken away at a point. Yes. You know, because he did not believe. So mm -hmm. his voice was taken away. And then, isn't it interesting that when his son now came, his son was called what? The voice mm -hmm. of the one crying in the wilderness. Mm -hmm. So you have that um, replacement pattern that goes on it's nothing new and it always when the church who i'm calling collectively the priesthood when they don't when they get complacent and the complacency comes in different ways the complacency comes with um outright rebellion the complacency comes with um the Bible says, to him that knows good and he doesn't do it, to him it is sin. The complacency can come in. You stop speaking truth to power. You, the complacency can come in. You've gotten yourself mixed up with a whole lot of things. When that complacency sets in, you see, because God 
always wants to have voices in every land. Mm -hmm. He always wants to have voices. And so if you have stopped being a voice, then somebody else will take it up. Is this to say, so does it mean you conform to the idea that uh, leadership is chosen by God? All leadership. Mm, that leadership is, I believe, and that's a very interesting question. I believe yes. that every human being yes. is ordained to lead in something. Every human being is ordained to, to lead in something. When you look at the setup here, mm -hmm. there is a leader in filming. Yes. There is a leader in editing. Mm -hmm. There is a leader in lighting. There is a leader in sound. When you see success, what you are seeing is an ecosystem of leadership. Yes, yes, yes. And yes. so when everybody is operating in their place of leadership, then you see great results. So that's what I subscribe to. Okay. And it's important for everybody to find their place okay. and stay on your lane. What happens a lot of times, people despise what they have and they esteem what other people have. And so they're always trying to be somebody else. Okay. All right? And in so doing, they move from the place where they were designed to shine as leaders and they move into obscurity. Nobody, now, not everybody is called into political leadership. Mm -hmm. Not everybody is called into spiritual leadership. Mm -hmm. But in the same way, not everybody is called into marketplace leadership. Okay. Not everybody is called to into entertainment leadership. Not everybody. So everyone, however, has a place where they are ordained to be and they will thrive and they will be leaders in that area. Okay. So in this sense, um, there has to be a relationship between the church and politics because politics is leadership, mm -hmm. right? And the church should be a voice of the people. Should there be, is, is there a certain... The church should be the voice of God and the hope for the people. It's not the voice of the people. The, it's the voice of God and the hope for the people. So where is the church going wrong, especially in there? Because uh, the article you shared with me, on uh, why the church should not be silent. Mm -hmm. uh, you quote Martin Luther King, yes. uh, that uh, what shall be remembered is mm. not the loudness of our enemies, but the silence of our friends. Absolutely. Please break that down for no, us. No, I mean, sincerely, okay, you have a friend, Yes. okay? Yes. And you have enemies out there, and yes. your enemies are shouting, all right? And you expect your friend to speak up. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> but he doesn't speak up. Mm -hmm. What does that do? Yes. That will hurt you more okay. than the noise coming from your enemies. And in the context of what has happened in Kenya, mm. it's that during the campaigns, the church was the loudest. The church you know, opened up their pulpits. They were endorsing. They were anointing. They were praying. And they were doing all that. Now, there are two ways to look at this. They were doing all that. Now, if things are not going the way you expected them to go, don't keep quiet. Come out. Be the voice of reason. Be the voice of God for the moment. That says, okay, you know what? Leadership of the country, young people of the country, come. How can we make this thing work? You know, we're not saying take sides. What we're saying is, if you were so fervent in the way you were endorsing people, then it is immoral to now keep quiet mm -hmm. when... Things are going like this. And we're not saying take sides. I want to emphasize that. Mm -hmm. I'm not. All we're saying is 
come out, be the salt of the earth. That's what we're saying. And could this be argued that, uh, let's say, the judgment of the church was that these are the people they endorsed, right? And by coming out and speaking, they will be contradicting their position in, with, in a direction that, uh, let's say, would come out as an admission of failure on their part in terms of the endorsement they gave. And also to tie this to a phrase uh, I can attribute to Spice FM, uh, the, the, the saying goes, it's an African proverb, that you should never start a fight because your friend is strong. Is this the church, can this be attributed to, they do not want to uh, contradict their earlier position, or they are not sure of their place? Who called them in the first place? You see, there is a verse in the Bible says, that says, no man takes this honor upon himself. A time comes when you have to decide, are we serving God or are we serving man? And to serve God does not mean you are going to be confrontational. I'm not saying, oh, come and attack. No. What we're saying is you cannot watch things begin to disintegrate and you are happy in your little corners because you think it's not affecting you. You can't do that. That's immoral. Mm -hmm. And that's the point I'm making. That if you had the conviction to come out at some point, if you had the conviction to come out at some point, even if it's not working. Now, how did God deal with this? Let me give you an example. God told Moses, speak to the rock, water will come out. Okay? The first time he told him, hit the rock, and water came out. Then the next time, he said, speak to the rock, water will come out. But Moses could not make the transition. Mm. Okay? Yeah. In yes, his mindset. Yes. Yes. So what did Moses do? He hit the rock. Yes. Now, guess what happened? He was in disobedience, but water came out. Why was the water coming out? Was it an endorsement of what Moses did? No. Sometimes God will allow the water to come out, not because of us, but in spite of us. But you know what happened after? God now had a private meeting with Moses and say, yo, what was that nonsense you did? For that, you are not entering the promised land. Mm -hmm. You understand what I'm saying? Yes, yes, yes. And that's the thing. So the church ought to come out and say, hey, you know what? Let's come. Let's, let's fix this. Yes, yes, yes. There is a solution. Okay. Let's fix this. All right? Okay. And we do that. And then if after you want to deal with people, go talk to people privately. But we should, the hope of a nation okay. should be the church. Thank you. Very well explained. Uh, the, the protests we are facing in the country right now have been branded as a Gen Z affair, right? As a social statistician, mm. uh, what is your assessment of how this is coming about and why it's something different from what we've seen before? Um, very, very simple. We live in a very enlightened age. This okay. is the age of enlightenment. I have a friend who came to visit with her three-year-old daughter. The daughter picked up the iPhone and knew exactly what to do, mm -hmm. all right? Yes. When you consider the fact that a lot of the things my generation spent money to learn, we would display with pride that we have learned Microsoft Word, we have <laughs> learned Excel, we went to school, we paid mm -hmm. to do that. You have a generation now, it's part of their growing up. Mm. We have a generation that grew up playing computer games. They have more computer sense than most of us put together. Now, you have a generation that isn't interesting. Now, one of the things that fascinates me, mm. if you look at that generation in Lagos, in Nairobi, in Mombasa, in New York, in London, and they are talking, they all sound the same. 
<laughs> they all sound the same. Because they watch the same watch movies. Their, watch their movies. Hi, guys. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, they that, all true, true, sound true. the same, regardless true. of where they come from. Ah, so true. they are speaking. There is a language that they are speaking. It's the language of the youth. It's the language of a new era. Now, so what we are suffering right now yes, yes, is yes. a communication breakdown. Yes, it's yes, like yes. somebody is speaking in Yoruba yes. and you are speaking in Swahili and okay. you don't understand each other. But you know what? All that generation, they understand each other wherever they are. That's why it's easy for them to mobilize. Mm -hmm. You know? That's why it's easy for them to mobilize. They are, it's an enlightened generation. We've never had a generation across the globe as enlightened as what you have today, okay. all right? Yes. That is the challenge. And so in the article, I had written another article before that. Mm -hmm. When you look at the response of the police, you know, the Stone Age did not end because the world ran out of stones. <laughs> okay? Yes. <laughs> the Stone Age ended because thinking overtook stones, mm -hmm. all right? Yes, yes, yes. Now, so you have new thinking with the young guys. You have old thinking with the police, all right? Okay. So what the police know is what, they, what they've always done is what they did. Mm -hmm. They don't know any other, and that is why today yes. a lot of people are going to be left behind, mm -hmm. not because they are bad, but because they don't understand the language of the day. So they can't understand why are these people behaving like this? I mean, I have, I have kids. I have Gen Z kids, mm. you know? So I understand them. I listen to them. You know, before, when I, when I was growing up, if my boss said, stand up, you stood up, come here, you, you went. Mm. If you ask these guys, do that, they'll say, why? You know? And yes. the answer my mother used to give, you know, he said, do this. He said, why? You could not even ask why. <laughs> you could not even ask why. Yes. You get a yes. slap. Yes, yes. But yes. if you even were bold, say, I am your mother. Bah! You yes. understand what I'm saying? Mm. So we can't do that now. Yes. So one of the biggest responsibilities we have Yes as an older generation, is to upgrade our thinking, upgrade our hard disks. We need to upgrade. And how are we going to do that? And I feel, I mean, you know, when I'm training leaders, I feel for my generation. Because it's like life has been, life has outplayed us. Let me give you an analogy. Yes. <laughs> When I was growing up, you know, maybe my brother brings food to the table and b pieces of chicken, and you want to take the biggest <laughs> piece. Eh? As you're trying to take that big piece of chicken, you just, ah, stop it, it's for your father. Yes, yes. Okay? Mm. You try again, let me take, ah, <laughs> stop it, it's for your father. Yes. So you realize you cannot win. Mm, mm. What do you do? You now resolve. Mm. One day, yes. I'll be a father. <laughs> when I become a father, let me yes. see who will stop me. Yes, from eating. That was our resolve as a generation. Can you imagine when you now become a father? Yes. You now bring the chicken. Hey, say now I'm a father. As you are going for it, then stop it. It's for the children. <laughs> Can you see the confusion? Yes, yes. That is what has happened. We cannot lead the way we were led. We cannot parent the way we were parented. We cannot do it. We need to, and that's why we need, it's going to take a lot of humility. Mm. The greatest skill of this era is the skill of listening. Not listening to argue. Yes. Not listening to come, to have a comeback. Yes. But listen to understand. Okay. When you have listened Yes. Because, you know, you cannot have a position if you've not listened. You cannot take a position if you don't understand. You may be saying different things. So you listen. I mean, look, let me tell you, when I was growing up, 
there were certain words that over the years have changed their meanings. Mm. When I was young, the word gay meant very happy. I'm okay. very, uh, oh. So, can you imagine, in fact, IBM, I think it was, had an ad that said, we are the gay men of IBM. Okay? Yeah. I, think, I think it was IBM. Mm. You can check that out. Mm. So, can you imagine me coming to there and say, yo, it's a lovely day, I feel so gay. Now, coming from my era, that means it's a lovely day, I feel so happy. Yes. But somebody listening to me saying that now, it's a totally different meaning. Yes. That's exactly what the problem is. Okay. So we need to listen. Listen to these guys. Don't assume. Listen. Then when you have listened, embrace. And then when you have done that, then you now say, okay, how can we adapt? That's the only way to guarantee continuity. Okay. How can we adapt? You see, the, the oak, <coughs> the, 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 the tree, the, 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 the storms and the wind, they will destroy big trees, but shrubs remain. You know why? Because the shrubs, they move with the wind. It's called adaptability. The oak stands tall that I cannot be moved. And then the storm lifts it up. Yeah. So yeah. listen, embrace, understand, and then adapt. adapt. Wow. And this goes to the place where generations talk about, uh, uh, I miss the old days when things were real, right? Uh, does this mean that we should all... Ad adapting means there is nothing like sticking to the old days. There's no old days, you know, because the truth is this. When my children, 20 years from now, mm. they will look back at this day and say these were the old days. But mm. it's the new day for them, you know? Yeah. So yeah. the problem happens when society... Things outside are growing faster than you're thinking. That's where the problem happens. You know, look, <laughs> this thing called thinking, you know, a lot of people think they are thinking, but they're not thinking. <laughs> they're just rotating ignorance in their head. Yeah. You know, a lot of people, this thing called thinking, it is mm. so powerful. Mm. You know, we have to continue, continue to develop ourselves. Mm. Um, when you look at the word civilization, yeah. one of the great meanings of the word civilization is making the best use of resources available at any point in time. Okay. Civilization. So, <laughs> a civilized person today is somebody who is able to make the best use mm -hmm of all the resources available today. Yes. Now, when you look at that, that means there is a difference between educated and civilized. Because you can be educated, but the average lifespan of degrees today is three to five years, some degrees. My father, my late dad, was a doctor, medical doctor, and I always told him, I said, if you are trying to prescribe to people Today, you know, or your dad, if you're trying to prescribe to people using the, 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 what you learned in medical school in 1966, you'll be a serial killer because you'll be prescribing things mm. that are outdated. You'll be prescribing things that, are, you know, people have developed resistance to them and all that. So life is a continuous learning experience. Where we get into trouble... Mm -hmm. is if we're trying to use yesterday's knowledge to deal with today's problem, we will be stuck. We will find ourselves in a very bad place. Uh, one of the things that stand out from what you've said is you have to listen more. Absolutely. Right? How does one develop the skill of listening? Humility. You know... The humility to accept 
that I don't know everything. The humility to accept mm -hmm. that what I know might be wrong. Mm -hmm. The humility to accept that what I know that was right yesterday might be wrong today. And the humility to know that this person mm -hmm. might know better than me. I'll give you two stories. Yes. Steve Jobs said, we don't hire brilliant people to tell them what to do. We hire them so that they can tell us what to do. And I learned that, and that's what I've done. I saw Winston Churchill said he succeeded because he surrounded himself with people who are more intelligent than him. I surround myself with people who are more brilliant, more intelligent than me. So I'm constantly feeding off their intelligence. I'm constantly learning. All right? One day, many years ago, my daughter, we were watching a show on TV. And while we were watching the show, my phone rang. I did not want to miss that part of the show. So I told my daughter, I said, ah, who is this girl? She said, pick it. I said, I don't want to miss that. She said, then you can pause. I said, no, you don't get it. It's not live. It's not a DVD. You know, back in the day, DVD. I said, it's not a DVD. It's live TV. She said, but dad, you can rewind. You can even pause. I said, you know, so I was getting impatient, you know. Now, let's look at context. The TV is mine. <laughs> I bought with my money. The decoder is mine. Even the girl talking is mine. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. She's now telling me what to do. Mm. Anyway, I went, picked the call. When I came back, she took the remote control, pause, rewind. I felt like a fool. Whenever I share that when I'm training, all my you know, leaders that I'm training, they begin to laugh. I said... It's good for you to laugh, but the truth is somebody is laughing at you somewhere right now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because somebody has the solution to what you are dealing with, but in your arrogance that I'm the boss, I must know all. The era, let me tell you, the boss or the, the effective leader of yesteryears was the leader who led with knowledge. The effective leader of today is the leader who is leading, not necessarily by his own knowledge, but by the ability to identify knowledge and apply that collective knowledge to meet a goal. That's the leader of today. This can be solved by listening. It can be solved by listening on both sides. Or on both sides. It can be solved by listening. It can be solved by proper communication. All right? Mm -hmm. I would like somebody to find out some simple things. I'll give you an example. Maybe you started work and you are being paid. Somebody was, I was having this conversation with someone today. Yeah. So I'm not going to take credit for what I'm about to tell you. Yeah. It's somebody else's. <laughs> yeah. And this friend of mine said, if you are working and you start off with 30,000 shillings, so you have a budget for 30,000, you know, whatever, maybe 20,000, you save X amount. Mm -hmm. He said, next year, maybe you have some promotion, okay? Mm -hmm. Now, your budget will increase, mm -hmm. isn't it? Yes. So when I'm talking of communication on both sides, yes. I'm saying... On one side, listen. On the other side, let's look at, let's track taxation since independence. Yeah, yeah. And let's see, what, are, what has the increment been like? Okay? Mm -hmm. And then, communication, transparency. I think people don't have a problem with tax. Mm -hmm. You know what I think people have a problem with? Yes. Where the money is going. I understand. And I think people have expressed as much. I think that's the problem. Issues. So, if we are sure the money is going into good stuff, then you know what? Transparency. Mm -hmm. This is it. Okay. You know? Okay. okay. Yeah. Okay. Makes sense. That's a very uh, beautiful explanation 
on the social uh, realm, uh, on um, the, the, the next level of collective as a people, right? Mm -hmm. When you come down to the individual, mm -hmm. uh, one of the main uh, reasons, um, the main focus of our conversation today is the improvement of the individual, right? And uh, um, media uh, right now, most people have forgotten the New Year resolutions that they set, which people are very um, adamant, people are very charged about when the year begins, right? What lessons have you learned about personal growth and productivity? Oh, well, that's very simple. Wherever you want to go and wherever you want to get to is not a function of I, I, I desire. Desire is cheap. Wishes are cheap. It is, are you able to pay the price for what you want? And um, every, every dream has a capacity demand. So, if I have a dream, I want to run, I read about uh, Cassius Clay, who later became Muhammad Ali, yeah. that every morning, in the cold, yes. he would get on, instead of getting on the school bus that was heated, he would jog alongside the school bus to go to school. Because the perfect present was to be in a warm bus, but the perfect future was to be the heavyweight champion of the world. So he understood the demand, the capacity demand of the dream. If you have a dream and you don't take time to understand the capacity demand of your dream, it will stay as a dream. I had a dream that I wanted to work with governments, I wanted to work with multinationals and all that. Mm. It didn't come as a wish. No, I've mm. paid my dues. You know, mm. I, I've paid my dues in, you know, the way I have developed myself for years. I remember in the early days, you know, I was spending every month about $500 a month on books. You know, because... I cannot go before a client and begin to talk some nonsense. I cannot argue, for instance, I cannot share opinions with, I, I, I cannot argue based on opinions. I always tell people, I don't have opinions. I am data driven. You know, that's why I, I, I totally believe in God we trust, but show me the data. You understand what I'm saying? Show me the data. Mm -hmm. So if you're going to argue about something, give, maybe it's because of my background, but if you're going to argue about something, give me data. Mm -hmm. Give me facts. Mm -hmm. All right? Mm -hmm. So I realized if I'm going to be able to do what I want to do, I want to work for the biggest companies in the world, which I've been able to do. All right? But it's not by going there to state my opinion. Nobody's going to pay me for my opinion. I don't care. Well, what will people pay for? I'm able to prove what I'm saying with facts, with data, with historical evidence. Now, that does not drop from the sky. That comes with a lot of investment in my mind, investment. A lot of times, unfortunately, people invest more in their outside than in their minds, you know? Mm -hmm. But I realize the capacity requirement is for me to, so if I'm working in, say, I've worked in 22 African countries. If I'm in Mozambique, for instance, and something comes up, I should be able to pull a case study from Cairo and pull some data from Lagos and something. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah. So the development, the capacity development. So if you have a New Year resolution, and you are any dream that's not making a demand on you to change something is not taking you anywhere. So I'm not concerned about your New Year resolution. I want to see what has changed in your habits and in your practices. Mm -hmm. What has changed? If I can see what has changed, then I know if you are going to go there, make it or not. So... People, most people go wrong because they have not defined, uh, they don't know what they are working towards. They have not defined that. 
They may know what they are working towards, but they have not built capacity for what they are working towards. So capacity is torturing yourself next to the school bus yeah. because of where you are going. Because of where you are going. Capacity is when my friends were buying clothes and traveling and doing all that, I was buying books. I was registering for courses. I was training myself. You know, when people were going out and hanging and having parties and all that, I was locked up in my study, reading and doing training programs, courses, because of where I was going. Is that universal for everybody? I think it should be for anybody who wants to go somewhere. You did not just get here by wishing. Mm -hmm. You must have done a lot with the kind of, you know, stage you have. Mm -hmm. It doesn't come by just wishing. You know, and unfortunately, somebody will see you now mm -hmm. and think, Eish, I want to be like him. And that's another thing. We need to be very careful about, you know, um, I'm going to say something. We need to be very careful about what motivational speakers tell us. You can be anything you want to be. You can be anyone. It's a lie, <laughs> my friend. You can be what you have built capacity to be. You can be what you have built capacity yes. to be. You can't just sit down and begin to wish that I was like him. And let me tell you, the, the growth, and I'm sure you have your stories. It's just that you are the one interviewing me. I'm not the one interviewing you. Because, listen, the success, success is never a straight line. It's never a straight line in any area. Nothing like people who are born lucky. Oh, please. Luck is generated. You have people who are children of, you know, billionaires. Would you not say they were born lucky? And today, they've messed up their lives. Uh -huh. So what happened to all that luck? Luck is generated. Absolutely. You know, I mean, the world is full of people who are born into very wealthy homes... There's a story I heard. Oh, my God. This guy is born into a super wealthy home. And so what he's doing is just enjoying his life, doing all that. And then there's this guy who started as a houseboy, began to develop himself, you know, go for evening classes, began to work with the billionaire father of that other guy and all that, and was there for many years. When the man died, that former houseboy became the head of the organization. Mm -hmm. The son was messed up. He was messed up. So what happened to that luck? This guy generated his own luck by preparation. He generated his luck. And that's one of the things that's so important, that it's not a straight line. And another thing I found out is that the character to deal with success and prominence is developed in the cocoon of obscurity. You know? Mm -hmm. So, you know, and people see like you that, oh, he's out there. But I'm sure you have stories of days yeah. when you were dreaming and this thing didn't look like it was working. Maybe you were crying and somebody had to encourage you. We all go through that. But we don't. You see, if we are after the fruit... And that's all we're going for. We will miss it because there's a process. Mm -hmm. And if we don't get the process, the Bible says if the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? And that's why when you look at anybody who is succeeding, do you know what I always tell people? Mm -hmm. They failed their way into success. And you say something very interesting about failure. You, I think, uh, I hope I got this correctly, that you're a champion of failure. Listen... <laughs> I cannot tell you, and let me, I'll, I'll first tell you why people fail. Mm -hmm. the, you know, because I have failed so many times. Yes, yes. All right? Yes. One of the reasons people fail is ignorance. Okay? Mm -hmm. So they are venturing into something, they don't know how it works. But you know, because I... somebody has said you can be anything you want to be. So you try anything. You enjoy it. If it's, so that's one of the reasons people fail, ignorance. Mm -hmm. Another reason people fail is an over 
uh, overrated um, evaluation of yourself. That means you think of yourself more highly than you can really, you overestimate your capabilities. You know? Another reason why people fail is yes. that they don't develop the humility to learn. Mm -hmm. You know, to learn under people. I realized, you know, I was an adult, I had children, I realized, hey, there are some things I need to learn. You know what I did? I shut down my business for some time and I went to serve as a PA to someone. Because that guy had something I wanted. I went to serve as his PA. And I was walking around with him for two months, learning, asking questions, and serving him. Let's look at this stage where you make this decision. What were you doing? Uh, and who did you become a PA to? And what did you learn in the two months? Was it worth it? It was absolutely worth it. I realized I had... Uh, let me tell you... <laughs> I grew up in an environment where um, my parents were very, very successful academicians, employers, employees. But I'll tell you an incident that changed my life. Okay. My parents were phenomenal people. And they, they sent me to what was then international school in Ibadan, Nigeria, which was when probably one of the probably the most expensive, best school in Nigeria mm -hmm. when we were younger. Mm -hmm. And we lived in, I'm talking of in the 70s, we lived in this house on like two acres. It had a drive-in. Ah, it was beautiful. And then I saw cars outside. And I mean, this poor school, I thought we were rich. Mm -hmm. My father was the chief medical officer for the state. Mm -hmm. Okay? So I thought we were rich. Then my father changed jobs. And I realized the house, the cars, the furniture, the bed we slept on, we owned nothing. Everything belonged to the government. That was a turning point for me. Can you imagine the shock? Telling Fred, hey, come, let's go to my house. Hey, my driver has come to pick me up. You know? And then suddenly you realize it was a bubble. Now, what that did to me, I made up my mind. I'm not going to tow this line. I'm going to be creative, and I'm going to work for myself. Oh, um, for your father to have all this, and he doesn't own it, uh, he didn't have the knowledge to, to put something, Ama, to put the money he gets from this lifestyle into something that he owns. That generation was not, you know, the, the, the concept of talking entrepreneurship is... Is not an old, in the 70s, nobody was talking entrepreneurship. Everybody just, you know, get a, you go to school, get a good degree, mm. and then get a job and live happily ever after. Yeah. yeah. You know, and then when you finish working, you get your pension and you continue living happily ever after. Yes, yes So nobody yes. was talking that kind of thing. Now, I'll tell you, before my dad died, he came and he was reading some of my books. He was underlining, he was taking notes. Yes, yes, yes. And he told my wife, he said, if I knew what your husband was writing in these books 30 years ago, my life would have been different. He realized that. That's what my then. father said to me. You didn't have a, a journey whereby you share your lessons before you start writing. Uh, and the lesson you learned when he switched jobs, you did not talk about that. I didn't talk about it. So he was, he had come. Okay. So he saw me, he saw what I was doing. He now said, ah. How did you get into all this? I told him, I said, I learned from you. He said, how? Ah, yeah. Then I yeah. told him the story. Mm. He was like, oh my goodness. I said, that's, that's where I learned from. So that was a turning point. That's your first life. relationship with failure? Yes. That was, it, it, I won't call it a relationship with failure. Yes. It was a relationship with reality. Okay. okay. That... Um, things are not always what they appear to be. And 
it developed something in me. In actual fact, it was a good thing for me because it stirred up something in me. Mm -hmm. Then um, I began to do business. I began to do stuff. You know, my first job when I left university, I worked as a researcher at the Institute for Policy and Strategic Studies because, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, my boss, my director general told me, he said, Wally, you know what? The way I see you, the way you think, you'll be better off going out as a consultant than in here. So my boss really encouraged me, yeah. you know. So here I was, and then when I launched out, uh, you know, there's something I call straight line assumption. And straight line assumption is characterized by the statement, all things being equal. When you step out, you realize that all things are never equal. <laughs> <laughs> never, 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 They're never. Never equal, my brother. They're never equal. So you cannot plan you know, with every all so, factors remaining constant. No, no, no. Because you see, and this is very interesting. The human mind is trained to think logically. So if I say two, four, six, eight, ten, uh -huh. twelve, uh -huh. six, so 17. guess what? Once the human mind picks up a sequence or a pattern, it can immediately project to the next phase. However, and that's what majority of us were trained for, for logic, mm -hmm. that get a good grade, you will get a good job, you will be paid, then when you have served for X number of years, mm -hmm. You will get your pension and all that, and you live happily ever yeah. after. We were trained logically. Now, so I give you the sequence of numbers. Yes, yes. What yes, if yes. I give you another sequence of numbers? Yes. And I go 2, 7, 20, 35. Ah. <laughs> you got it. Yes. So, we were trained for logic, but when we are faced with things that are not logical, mm. we don't know what to do. We are paralyzed. Mm. That is why a lot of people who've tried to go into business, they stop and they say it was a bad idea. Because when they start, on paper, their business plan, all things are equal. <laughs> <laughs> Let me give you an example. Back in those days, you know, when Mandela was in prison, mm. there was this Nigerian that thought he had stumbled on a brilliant idea. Mm. And that idea was, people were, you know, um, releasing music. Even Shaka Shaka had done something about Mandela. People were releasing music mm. about free Mandela. So Niger Boy thought that this is a good opportunity. So he went to studio and did an album calling for Mandela to be freed, okay? <laughs> Borrowed money to go into the studio. <laughs> then when they had done the recording, he was neck deep in debt by this time. <laughs> when they had got no money, so he now planned the day they were going to launch the album, that people will come and give uh, money. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Between recording in the studio mm. and releasing the album, Mandela was freed. <laughs> My friend... <laughs> Mandela was freed. What do you do? <laughs> the investment was Mandela to remain in prison. Now Mandela has been freed. <laughs> so that's a classic case. Yes. Your business plan mm. is a straight line. All things being equal. Mm. Mm. It's logical. Mm. But in the real world, things are not logical. So you have to train your mind. Yes to think creatively, mm -hmm. not being stuck yes. in a box of logic. Yes. And so when you hear people say, you've got to think out of the box, what box? The box of logic. Okay. Come okay. out of that box. All right? So when I started business, I've you know, dealt with a lot of failure. A lot of failure. And, you know, um, you never get to a point mm. in your growth 
where you will not have something that did not work. Yeah, yeah, yeah that, that I can attest, yes. At every level. Yes. At every level, you know. So, what do you do? You need to develop the... I wrote a whole book on creative thinking. If I, a lot of my books, I've written 22 books. A lot of my books address the issue of the mind. Mm. Dealing with this, our thinking, mm. you know, and all that. Because once we're able to get to that point, I mean, goodness, I've had failures that want to blow me out. You know, failures where you have an idea, like the album, you've borrowed money, you've taken facilities to do the, like the album, then between that and here, Mandela is free. You have a debt. Yes, 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 you are, yes. What do you do? You did not plan for that. What do you do? That's what you meant, budget for failure. Yeah, what do you do? You know? And your integrity is blown. I mean, mm. goodness. I, I was having a chat with a friend of mine some time ago. Yes. And he said, if you look at the stories of every great success... There is a time in their journey where it looked like they lacked integrity because they were in that creative space, that logical space, mm, mm, mm. and Mandela is released. Yes, 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 yes. And you are now, how do we deal with this? I, I mean, somebody who plans to come to Nairobi, say for a meeting, that was going to turn his life around. He has come from Lagos. He's gotten a loan from Lagos. He's coming to Nairobi for a meeting yes. that will change his life around. Yes. Then he gets to Nairobi and it is Occupy Parliament. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. So he can't move. Mm, 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 mm. What does he do? So <laughs> the best formula for success is flexibility. You have to be. And, and you always have to realize that the fact that this did not work is not enough justification to give up. You will keep at it. You know? And that's why keep a, at it. A, another thing, you know, you hear a lot of people, you know, because I'm a statistician, mm. I question everything. Mm -hmm. Like I said, I don't deal with opinions. I deal with facts, with data. Mm. I'm sure you've heard this said by people. And when you hear some of these things, they sound very wise. Have you heard someone tell you that the definition of insanity is what? Doing the same thing over mm -hmm. and over and expecting what? Different mm -hmm. results. That's what they tell you. All right? And I actually said it for a while. Then I began to think about it. You have to question some of these things we hear. That how can the definition of insanity be doing the same thing over and over and over again? Yet the same people who tell us that will quote that, you know what? You have to be persistent like Thomas Edison. Yes, yes, he did yes. 10,000 <coughs> experiments yes, yes, before yes. he got to the... <laughs> yes, so yes, yes. Where is the line? The only way to become a master at something is doing it over and over again. That's the, so we need to begin to question some of these things and question even our assumptions. I think it comes in context. Mm. Like there are certain things that if you do in the wrong direction, hoping to get different results in terms of reaping benefits. Let's say, for example, uh, you don't save money, you don't watch your finances, but hoping you'll get rich. I think in that context... Well, yeah, ab ab absolutely. Yeah, I agree with you. Then we should rephrase it okay. because phrasing it that way has led a lot of people to give up maybe just before their breakthrough. You did not become a success after you shot one video. No. <laughs> no, 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 no. You kept at it. Yes, 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 yes. Over and over and mm -hmm. over. I was with a friend of mine in Nigeria some time ago, big celebrity musician. So I'm in his house and he had 
all sorts of albums on the wall, about 20. I said, what are these? He said, these are all the albums I recorded before people knew me. <laughs> oh, yes, 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 yes. You know, that's, that's, that's. so if you have, um, if you have, if you cannot trace the story or the journey of a successful person, then it's questionable. Powerful. That's deep, actually. Ah. The one reason, the number one reason people fail is ignorance, right? Uh, why? Okay, and then failure is not a bad thing. Ignorance, assumptions. Oh, assumptions. Like I said, yes. Assumption, overestimating your capabilities, not being humble enough to learn, to submit yourself to learning. There's a lot of reasons. And how does a person who is pushing in the right direction, which they genuinely believe is the right direction, know that however hard they push, nothing good will come out of it? Nothing good will come out of it. How right. do you know you are pushing in the right direction? Mm -hmm. You may genuinely believe that you're pushing in the right direction, mm -hmm. right? You keep doing the same thing over and over yes. again, accepting, uh, expecting uh, different mm -hmm. results. It's a good thing, but it's not for you. Mm -hmm. How mm -hmm. do you define your purpose, to put it shortly? You are going to be very, very sincere with yourself. You are going to have to build a... Um, let me tell you what. There are certain questions. I run a lot of one-on-one -on -one programs for leaders. And there are certain questions I normally ask. And when I ask those questions, you already know. You know, for instance, I've seen a lot of people. They are doing things because that is the societal expectation of them. Okay. Now, I wrote a book. Uh, it was called Mental Independence. The, you know, an innovator's guide to thinking in the, without precedence. And I had a dream that I had sold half a million copies of that book. Mm. So middle of the night, I was so excited, I woke my wife up. I said, baby, baby, baby. Mm. I had a dream. We just sold half a million copies. And she just goes, okay. And she continued sleeping. I was so angry. Yes. But then, that day, I got a powerful revelation that, you know what? Even though she's on the bed next to me, she cannot independently verify that dream. Yeah. Because no dream has a witness. No dream has a witness. Mm -mm. So, you have to be very, very sincere with yourself. You may be sincerely wrong. All right? And I found out, if you're sincerely wrong, somehow you will find your path. You may not know what you want. And nobody should get frustrated because they don't know what they want. But you know what? You will know what you don't want. You so you begin to eliminate. I don't want this. I don't want this. I don't want this. I don't want this. And you know what? You will ultimately be left with that which you want. Okay. And then also, I go back to where I started from about training yourself. Let me give you a powerful example. 30th of November, 2022, something happened that changed the world. On the 30th of November, 2022, it was the day ChatGPT was released. Okay. Now, that means... Before 30th of November 2022, nobody had any experience with ChatGPT. Yes. Okay. If you Google right now or go to YouTube mm -hmm. and say ChatGPT expert, you will see all sorts of videos. One of them has 3 million views. Uh, there's even someone that is saying we certify people in ChatGPT. Listen. That means we all had the same starting point. <laughs> 30th yeah, of November. Uh, yes, yes, yes. 30th yes, of yes. November 2022. So what did they do to be able to now do that? 
They built capacity. They dove into it. They went into it. You see, and this is, you see, for some things, experience is important. As a consultant, client, I, they invite me to speak with boards, senior leadership, and so on and so forth. Okay? I've been at this for over 30 years. So, they value my experience. If you're in hospital, you value a doctor that has experience. Yes. You value a driver that has experience. So for some things, yes, experience is important. But for a lot of things in today's world, experience is, has been thrown to the back burner. And it is only if you expect the future to be a complete replica of the past is experience now important. So ah. nobody has experience in the future. For the future. Nobody has. Yes. Chat GPT, co-pilot, all these things are coming out. Nobody had experience. Mm. You will develop the experience. And then if you are bold enough that you know what? Even though Chat GPT came out at the same time, we all saw it at the same time. But you know what? I have invested enough man hours in this thing. I can teach you. Boy. Capacity. Cap two words that will make anybody successful, capacity and audacity. The audacity to say, I will teach you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Who are you? <laughs> it's audacity. Yes. Let me tell you another thing. Do you know? And when I say this, people, it's such an obvious thing I'm about to say. I run an institution called the Street University. And I'll talk about that. But... I was inspired because yes. Yes. in doing my research, and that's why I said I don't come from the place of opinion. I was doing my research when I was going to start the street university. I wanted a different kind of institution because there are a lot of economic empowerment programs, and they are very correct on the economics. They have how to do your business plan, how to do your marketing plan, and all that. Mm. But you can get the economics right. If the mindset is not, is not right, it's useless. It's like somebody who won the lottery. You know, majority of them go back to where they started from. Average. So I yes. wanted to start an institution that will teach the economics, but will spend so much time on the mindset. And we did that, and we have some of the most phenomenal results you have ever heard of. People who we give startup capital of 1,000 shillings, and over four weeks, they generate 100,000. Is that possible? Absolutely. Give me a bunch of young people, lock them with me for a while. If I work on their thinking, you'll be shocked. You see, you don't know what is possible. Eh? You don't... Oh, my goodness. Yes. If you don't know what is possible, if you don't know what is possible, you will settle for what is available. Ah, yeah. So, Basi, what's the difference? Eh? I'm coming. I'm going to go... You know, I was talking about... street university. If you don't know what is possible, you settle for what is available. Yes. Do you know... So, when I was doing my research for the street university, mm -hmm. I found out the first university in the world, mm -hmm. the first accreditation degree awarding university in the world was in a place called Fez in Morocco. <laughs> now, listen, started by a woman. But do you know, mm. the founders of the first university were not graduates. They couldn't have been graduates. Come on, where did they go to school? So capacity and audacity. <laughs> that, I'm going to set up something, you will pay, you will come and learn. Mm -hmm. I will teach you for three years or four years. After that, I'm going to give you a piece of paper. And that paper will define how people relate with you for the rest of your life. That's audacity. Mm -hmm. That is audacity. <laughs> and what's the difference between audacity and lying to yourself? Audacity oh, and being very, delusional. very simple. Audacity is, you know, lying to yourself is... It's fake. It's fake it till you make it. I don't believe in faking it till you make it. Audacity is, 
I'm good. Okay, let me teach you something. <laughs> mm -hmm. That uh, if you draw a quadrant, mm? yes. on the top left of the quadrant, mm. you put CC, conscious competence. Conscious competence is I am good. Yes, so on that I put conscious competence. Conscious competence is I am good. I know I am good. I know why I am good. And I can reproduce it anywhere. CC. Conscious mm -hmm. competence. Mm -hmm. In the next quadrant, you put unconscious competence. Okay? Mm -hmm. Unconscious competence is I am good. But I don't know how good I am. And I don't know what makes me good. So let me break it down in practical terms. You are working for a company. Maybe you are in Mombasa. And you have done wonders in Mombasa. Hey! And they say, we need help in Yeri. Okay? So please, you leave Mombasa. Go to Nyeri. The same magic you did in Mombasa. Go and do it in Nyeri. Mm -hmm. Then you get to Nyeri and you fail. You know why? Unconscious competence. You yourself did not know why you're good. Why you are succeeding. It could have been some other factors in Mombasa that you are not aware of that made you succeed there. It could have been some support structure in the office in Mombasa that was lacking in Yeri that made you successful. Yes, yes, yeah. yes, 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 yes. All right? So, but conscious competence means I know I am good. I know why I'm good. And I know everything I need to put around me to reproduce that result everywhere. Mm -hmm. And I can mentor people and teach people. Okay? Then the third quadrant, the third one, you put conscious incompetence. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, okay. Conscious incompetence means I am not good, <laughs> but I know. <laughs> now, <coughs> and that's not a bad thing. Mm. That's not a bad thing. Yes. I'm not good. And I know, I know mm. I'm not good. That puts you in a place where you can be teachable. Mm. You will learn. Mm. So that's not a bad thing. Mm. Okay? You know the worst one of them all? The last one, unconscious incompetence. You are a fool, a mumu, and you don't know you are a mumu. So you'll be bragging around, talking nonsense with audacity. You understand what I'm saying? So, you say, what's the difference? Yes. Now, when I know, conscious, when I'm consciously competent, mm -hmm. And I exhibit audacity. Mm -hmm. There's nothing wrong with that. I'm audacious because of what I know about myself. Mm. All right? That's why I go to places. I, people say, do you have PowerPoint? I don't need it. I have the data up here. Mm. I have a photographic memory. I, I have the data. If you give me a book, I can scan through the book in a few minutes, and I'll tell you what it's about. All right? Yes. I have photographic memory. Yes, yes, yes. But how did I get it? Repetition. I've been doing that for years. So, so you can develop a photographic memory. Oh, absolutely. So when I go to those places and they will read, I don't require notes. I don't require notes. I don't require uh, PowerPoint or anything. It's here. You're okay? to the person taking so notes. That <laughs> is... Uh, Conscious competence. Yes. So why am I able to go and say, I don't, need a, I don't need a computer, I don't need PowerPoint, I don't need anything? That's audacity. Mm. You are going to speak with a group of very, very important people. Yeah. You know? But I've always grown up with the mantra that those who live ready never have to get ready. You know? Those who live ready never, get, never need to get ready. Absolutely. So I know my competency. I'm very conscious of it. And that develops a level of audacity that ignorant people will interpret as arrogance. 
Okay. All right? Okay. But listen, when Bill Gates says, I'm rich, man, <coughs> he's not bragging. Yes, yes, yes. If you have a problem with it, then you have a problem. Mm -mm. It is you who has a problem. <laughs> it is you who has a problem. Yes, yes, yes. You know? So, that's the difference. When you say about, we don't fake it till we make it. You see, that unconscious, unconscious incompetence, Mumu, that's the guy that fakes it till he makes it. Mm -hmm. We don't need to do that. And if he makes it, mm -hmm. uh, th does the, is the making it invalid? Do you have a fool who can survive to the end? With the success they, they get. The fool is successful. Yes, the fool is successful. They faked it till they made it. Right? Then they will have no substance. They have no substance. But they are rich, right? They, 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 they are successful. Let's not I'll those. give you an example. I'll give you an example of that. Why do you think people steal money? Why do you think people get into government and they steal and steal? Do you know, if you have, let me tell you, if you have $10 million today, that's uh, about 1.2, 1.3 billion shillings. Mm? Mm -hmm. Do you know, if you handle that well, your great-grandchildren will be sorted for life. Okay. Your great grandchildren. Yes. If you will handle it well. If you handle it well. So why do you hear cases of somebody has stolen and they still they are they already have money and they keep stealing and stealing and stealing? You know? Why? It's simple. They faked it. They have no substance. So you know what? The only way they know, they, they're even so scared that if we lose what we have, we don't know how to get it back. So, stealing becomes the best insurance policy they have. Let's continue stealing so we will not fail. So someone who has substance will only steal 1.3 billion? No, somebody who has substance doesn't need to steal it because yes. he knows how to make it back. He knows how to generate it. That's the thing. You know, I, I, I have a problem. And this is, let me tell you, one of the challenges we have on the continent. Yes, yes. You... A lot of people... You, one of the reasons why I'm writing a lot of books that I'm writing now is because we have a problem. Books on leadership, great success, business stories, and all that. Look for Africans. They are very few. They are very, very few. I read uh, the late uh, Jenga Karume's biography. Phenomenal. You know, I love biographies. Mm -hmm. But they are very few. So... You would, we know more about Bill Gates, about Steve Jobs, about Jeff Bezos. We know more about them than the authentic entrepreneurs here. But you know why that is so? Because let's think, when you look across the continent, what do the wealthiest people in Africa what do they have in common? Well, a large percentage of them. It's not absolute. What do they have in common? Do you know what they have in common? Politics. They were either once in government or have family in government or have friends in government. There was a government connection. Now, if your wealth is solely the product of a government connection, what entrepreneurship are you going to teach the next generation? What are you going to teach them? That's part of the problem we have. So, they can't write books on how to build a thriving business. They can't. They can't write books on how to build a high-performance team. They can't. We want to know. But you see, when there is no story, then we put a question mark at the yes, end. Yes, 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 yes. yes, yes, yes. Ah, 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 ah. Whoa. And um, uh, my assessment of where we are as a country is a culmination or a compound effect 
of a lot of things done wrong. What does it take to recover when things seem like they are far too gone, both in terms of society and the individual? Let's say, um, let's say for example, when your dad says, says to you that if he could have read your book 30 years ago, it could have changed his life. Is there anything like too late or there is time for recovery and the, or there is a formula for recovery? I came across uh, a statistic that um, the majority of people yes. hit financial freedom, listen to this, in their late 50s and in their 60s. Mm, 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 mm. I've, heard that. I've heard that too. But you know what's happening? Yes. Somebody is 25 and he has not yet blown. Uh, he gets very upset yes, and yes, all yes, that. Yes. But back to your question, let me mm. tell you what. Mm. If I'm going to the River, yes. and I'm told you will get onto Uhuru Highway, you will get one roundabout, another roundabout or whatever, and then don't turn there, go, and then you will see one petrol station, I'm just making this up, one petrol station, then go for five minutes, you see another petrol station, then turn and you get to where you're going. If everything is going well, you see the first petrol station. After five minutes, you see the second petrol station, and you turn, and you're supposed to arrive at your destination in 10 minutes. And you don't arrive at your destination in 30 minutes. You don't keep going, hoping you will get there miraculously. Yes, yes. You turn back. When was the last time I knew I was on track? Ah, yes, yes. So yes, yes, you, yes, have, yes. you need to have the humility. Like when I went to submit myself to that billionaire to be his PA. You turn back. When was the last time I was on track? You go back there and then recalibrate. That's the way. Wow. I think we left something hanging for the billionaire. Okay. What stage of life were you in, right? And the decision to go work for the billionaire as a PA, how did you, what was your entry? Was he your friend? Did you have a formula for introduction? All right, And what cool. do you learn in the two months? I was living in America and I was moving back to Africa. I was moving to Nigeria. I didn't understand how things worked. All right? I, and my background, I didn't understand money. I didn't understand. When I was growing up, I didn't know people need to have a vision because it was all a straight line. Yes. So I was with a pastor in London who shared with me about this guy. He's gone to Nigeria. He's built a new company and um, they are worth over a billion dollars and all that. And I, I simply said, please, I'd like to meet him. He said, no problem, I can arrange that. So he made the introduction. I flew to Nigeria, to Abuja, I met with him. And I said, and you know, people like that, and this is interesting, people like that, they are used to people coming to them to ask for money. Yes. I went to him and I said, I don't want money. Don't even pay me. I'm seeing it like I'm going to school. Or I've gone for a course. Please let me serve you. Let me follow you around. Let me learn. Let me ask questions. Let me have mm. close a front row seat to how you operate. I did that for two months. He was really he was glad. He opened up. He taught me things. You know, and it was fantastic. Mm. And that really helped me. Yeah. And, you know, one of the things I've learned is that when you are sincere in your quest for growth and you're ready to build capacity, God will bring people your way. 
that will help you. Yeah. I remember when I came back to Kenya, um, I, I was now coming to get into the corporate space. Nobody knew me, you know? And then I had one thing working against me, I'm Nigerian. This, this, uh, tell me this is around uh, 2013, Oh, 2014. no, 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 no. This was way be before then. This was, um, I had first come to Kenya in 94. Mm. I was in Kenya 94 to 99. Yes. Went to America. I went through Nigeria. Then 2004. I oh, came 2004. back. 2004. Ah, okay. You know, okay. so nobody knew me. And um, it was a rough period, you know. I'm trying to build something from scratch. So around 2000 and, you know, about two, three years or so, I now began, you know, those days email was the mode of communication. There was yes. no social media. Yes, yes, yes. So I'm in Kilifi, then I go to Kilifi Books. And it was 60 shillings for one hour in the cyber cafe there. So I developed friendship with the person in charge of the place. So mm -hmm. even after my 60 shillings, they let me go on for a while. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I would research. And then after some time, I began to write articles and just send them out to people as emails. And that's the thing. You know, don't wait for perfect conditions. We can create conditions with our decisions, you know? So I began to send out emails. Now, one of those emails landed in the mailbox of uh, somebody who became a mentor to me, Samson Osero, who at that time was the principal of the Human Resource Institute, uh, Human Resource College. But not long after that, I think about 2012 or so, he became the executive director, the CEO of the Institute for Human Resource Management. You know, and somebody had been forwarding my emails to him. So he was going to have this first conference, and he invited me to come and speak about the things I was talking about. And I was talking about creative thinking, mm. which I eventually turned into a book. Mm. So I went and I began, I spoke about it. What more do I want? He has exposed me to over 250 HR managers. All right? And then what he did for me, I didn't know how to contextualize my dream in a Kenyan way, you know, how to write my proposals, how to do all that. He taught me everything. All right? And... Um, that was my entry into corporate Kenya. Mm, mm, mm. Then I continued writing those articles. And one day, one of your former colleagues, somebody sent me a message from, from Nation and said, um, we're getting your articles. Would you like to write for the newspaper? I thought it was a joke. Mm, 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 mm. And they said, send two articles. So I sent two articles. And two weeks consecutively, they posted it. They wrote back to me. People love your articles, so we're giving you a column. Mm, mm, mm. What? Me? Yes. A column in the newspaper. It was the best thing that ever happened to me. So I began to write because I love to write. I believe I write better than I speak. I was writing every week, and then it began to grow. It began to grow. People began to communicate with me, began yes. to communicate with me, yes. and then turning point, again, you're talking of key moments in my life. Yes. One day, I get a mail, come to the Kenya School of Government. I did not know there was a Kenya School of Government, so I go. The Director General was Professor Margaret Kobia. She said, she's been reading my articles, she likes what I'm doing, I said, what you are writing, leadership stuff, is going to, is what the government of Kenya needs. We have a course called Strategic Leadership Development Program, and you are going to be teaching transformational leadership. My God. That was introduced. That was now my introduction, entry into government. I said, oh, my God. You know, I'm a blessed person. That is favor. I, I, I don't know what I did to deserve that, you know. And it just began to grow. It just began to grow. But these are people that helped me. So when you see me talking the way I'm talking right now, mm. it didn't drop from the sky. You know, it's been years of consistency, but also people who believed in me to help me to become a better version of myself. And I'm forever grateful to them.
cause and effect. Mm. So if you hadn't uh, created the opportunity, because I believe this is also, Bill Gates also, also has a similar story that uh, his parents were teaching at a school mm. or the school he was taken to, they had access to computers. To computers. Yes. And they had enough time compared to any other person Absolutely. to do coding. And they went in. Mm. So if you did not have access to this computer, if you did not create a relationship with the cyber person, you will not have had time. Absolutely. Do you see it any other way? That's the way it is. Yes. That's the way it is. You know? Yes, 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 yes. yes. That, that's the way it is. Mm. That mm. if I had not gone there, and you see, this is the challenge. Um, a lot of people, remember when I talked about civilization? Yes, 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 yes. Making the best use of resources available to you at any point in time. And that was it. The resource, I didn't have a computer of my own, but I could go to the cyber cafe. Yes. 60 shillings, you know? And then I remember another day, I talked about I didn't have a computer of my own. I remember one day I'm sitting, because again, when I had gone to Nigeria, I had failed. That was another failure. You know, mm -hmm. business failed. So I came to Kenya green with nothing. So I didn't have a computer. Then one day, somebody you would, you would know, he called me. Um, now that morning, I, I said, God, I need a computer. So I looked, you know, and somebody miraculously called and said that, oh, there's a laptop for sale. You know, I said, oh my God, I didn't have the money for that. You know, I said, you need to look at people's stories before you judge them. <laughs> so that afternoon, uh, Pastor Peter Dera and his wife came to visit me and they brought a gift for me and it was enough money to buy my computer. Ah, yeah. So yeah. these are integral people that played a role mm -hmm. at different points, yes, yes, you know? Yes. And if we grow to a point where we think we are so successful, we don't need these people, we don't need to acknowledge those who helped us, I believe we'll put a cap to the kind of growth we can experience. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Powerful. You know, and... Yes. Through that, now, um, like I said, I've worked with different governments. I've served, you know, not, I mean, different leaders of nations across the continent and so on and so forth, yes, you know. Sounds, but it yes, all started sounds. from that scene. From that, uh, be Before we close the conversation, because I believe it would also be very ambitious to compress over 30 years of experience, in a conversation like this one and i believe this is the first of many on this platform and thank you for making time for us uh i promised ama we promised ama we agreed to keep something to share with our audience because it would be selfish if you told that to me alone about something that happened in august last year that changed your life <laughs> yes you, you have a great photographic memory <laughs> <laughs> uh, except for the notes but <laughs> yes yes um I stay in Kilifi County. Yes. Right. I was coming to Nairobi on the 11th of August, and I'd been getting tired. Okay. Uh, I love to swim. So I'd normally swim for an hour every day, but I would find myself getting tired and yes. all that. So it got to a stage I couldn't swim for long. Anyway, so I came to Nairobi for a meeting. The meeting was at, uh, it was at 4 p.m. I landed about midday, went to have lunch with a colleague of mine here. After lunch, I was so tired. Whenever I'm going somewhere, I have a team that goes with me, that the guys that are gonna set up my book stand mm -hmm. and things like that. So. Mm -hmm. We had, they had gone ahead. So I said, you know what? Let me go back to the hotel and let me just sleep for an hour. So I went to the hotel. As I was about to sleep, I know a lot of people won't believe what I'm about to say now, but it was almost as if there was somebody next to me saying, whatever you do, don't sleep. So I got up. When I got up, 
I had that, you know, urge up leading to open the door of the room, and I left it ajar. It wasn't up to one minute later. It felt like somebody was punching me from inside. I had a massive heart attack. And I just fell on the ground. And I was clutching my chest, shouting. As I was going, I was able to put a speed call through to my wife. And she just heard me shouting, I shall live and not die. I shall live and not die. She knew something was going on. Now, thank God, by the time they called for emergency, doctors and all that, my door was opened. So they just walked in, took me to the hospital. And I was taken into surgery. Um, it was a, and people can Google this, they call that kind of heart attack, they call it the widow maker. 90% of the artery was blocked. So even the doctors were coming and they said, it's a miracle. You're not, they told my daughter, you're not supposed to be here. You know, you're not supposed to be here. And they said that, Something on that scale could have led to some more complications. That even if you survive, you'd be on a wheelchair. You know, because you could have developed a stroke or something. You know, you'd be on a wheelchair for that. So, you know, and then I learned something that after a heart attack, there's something that's even almost as bad as a heart attack, and it's called the post heart attack trauma. So. For a long time, I was out. So people, you know, a lot of people, you say, Wally, you disappeared. You went out of circulation, you know? Mm -hmm. I was battling for my life, yeah. you know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and it, it changed my life in a way I cannot imagine. I cannot. This this feeling, mm -hmm. this uh, this thing that tells you, whatever you do, don't sleep. Have you ever have you had time to interrogate what this was? Oh, I know what I know what that was. That was God speaking. But how many people believe in that? <laughs> you know. So are you saying? Uh, in, because I'm sure you've had a field day mm -hmm. with this experience, mm -hmm. right? Would you, would you, I'm a hypothesis person. I love hypothesis so much. You are a fact person. But I'll still ask you this, because you brought it up. Do you think there are people who die just because they ignored that voice? Or they don't, they can't recognize that voice. Yeah. Ignore, or they can, they're not able to recognize. You know, and that's sad. But that, I think that's a whole different topic for another day. I know, but just touch on it for a bit yes. because you are a person who survived that. Yes. You have experienced that. The difference between us having this conversation today or Dr. Wale, who uh, I believe we can say this is a special dedication to my younger brother, Max. Uh, Dr. Wale, who he would do anything to attend a conference you are talking in, in around 2013, 2014, is here or was past tense is the decision to listen to that voice. It's a combination of things. Um, it's a combination of things, a lot of things. I'm a very spiritual person. I, my whole life is built on the principles of faith and God's word. So there's a lot that happened before then. Um, one of the things I've learned is how to develop my spirit. I, re I, I, I realized long ago that the Bible says, for as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. I learned that the key to my longevity is the ability to hear. You know, David said, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. The shepherd, and he says, Jesus says, my sheep hear my voice and they follow. So, he wants us to be able to hear him. But you have to develop yourself yes, yes. to be able to do that. Thank you. You know, you have to develop yourself to be able to do that. And 
I've gotten myself into a lot of trouble because I didn't listen in other areas. Mm. The Bible says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not to your own understanding. Sometimes when you hear that voice, say, hey, dude, it's not adding up. Let me do it this way. And then you get into mm. trouble, not realizing that God sees yesterday, today, and tomorrow as one. Oh, ah, okay, okay, okay. <laughs> 22 books in total. Mm. Um, and counting. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, do you stalk with Nuria? Yes. Nuria ah, you stalk with Nuria? Yes, yes, Ah, yes. Sawa, sawa. of your 22 books, yes. which one do you recommend someone who's never interacted with your content to start with? The latest one, it's called Mega Thinking for Mega Living. Mega Thinking for Mega Living. Ah, okay. I wrote that after the heart attack. Okay, I think that's my next after I finish is uh, uh, Honorable Isa Kassan's book. Yes. On referee for a yes. dirty, ugly game. I think that's next in line. Uh, check them out. Your favorite of the 22? Yes, this is the one you recommend first. But of the 22, which books carries the deepest story? All of it? them. Because when I was writing all of them, there was an inspiration. There was a drive at that point in time. When I wrote The Billionaire Within, The Billionaire Within talks about some of the things I've talked about my childhood. I'm not saying I'm a billionaire, <laughs> but talks about my childhood and exposure yes. and things like that. Yes. Yeah. You know, um, when I wrote um, Beyond Intelligence, it's, been, you know, it's the simple practice to stay relevant. I wrote that because I saw a lot of very intelligent people were becoming irrelevant because they had thought that intelligence was all that was needed, mm -hmm. you know? So I wrote that, and that's where I did a lot of study to look at why Africa is where we are. We're not researching into the future. Mm -hmm. You know, Israel has <coughs> about 8,000, Israel has the largest number of researchers by one million inhabitants in the world. As at the time I wrote the book, Israel had over 8,000 researchers per million inhabitants. United States has about 4,000. South Korea has about 6,000. All of them are in the thousands. And then when we go Kenya to Africa, Kenya has 225. Ah, uh, no, that was meant you to know? be. Uh, 225 at that time. Per a million. But that, per, per, per researchers, for every 1 million inhabitants, Nigeria has 38. Can you imagine? That tells you why we are lagging behind. And let me tell you what. A lot of, um, you know, there are some things that just get me upset about this continent. The word benchmark. You can benchmark to improve. Don't benchmark to copy. <laughs> because if you are benchmarking to copy, whoever you are copying will always be ahead of you. You see, <laughs> and that's the difference between the Chinese. They, they, they benchmark, they bought other things, and then they produced it cheaper and better, you know? Mm. So you have a lot of people benchmarking. And I always give examples. I say, come on. The pyramids of Egypt for 3,800 years were the tallest man-made structures on the earth. Who are they benchmarking? Eh? You look at um, uh, the London Underground, the train system. Developed in 1863, first of its kind. Who are they benchmarking? Yeah. In 1811, the master plan of Manhattan, New York, was developed. A master plan that had roads when people were riding horses. Who were they benchmarking? You know, and this is part of the, the core, part of the core of our problem as a continent, is that we're not researching into the future. So if you don't research into the future, you will live in a future that has been researched into by others. And another thing, even these numbers for our researchers you know, on the continent, we are not researching to f discover new things. We are researching to find out what others have already researched. That's what we're doing. So we need a generation and this Gen Z is going to do it all. Mm. They would mm. do it. A generation that is bold, like I said, capacity and audacity, will research and will develop things I has not seen, I has not heard. We begin to benchmark our own imagination. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for saying that. I think I feel challenged on that point. 
But then again, I'll take you back uh, as a final point. You had to clarify that you're not a billionaire. Mm -hmm. Would you like to be one? I don't think there's anybody who will not say yes to that. You know, um, money gives you options. You know, but above that, I'm confident I know my place in life. I know my place in life. And if I need a billion to accomplish that, my, I tell people, I'm, I'm working with young people mm -hmm. to change their mindsets, to help them get started in life. I have over 500 young people who look at me and call me daddy, you know, mm -hmm. because we're investing in their lives. Now, what will money do for me? It will help me scale that. Because my vision is to transform Africa one man at one mind at a time, mm. making poverty and unemployment a choice and not a sentence. A choice and not a sentence. So when I see the level of un unemployment across the, con the continent, it grieves me. It's like I'm not doing my job. It grieves I take it personally. And that's why I'm doing what I'm doing. Our relationship, my relationship with you is very interesting because we have met in, I, I believe I can qualify the statement to say several corporate events. Yes, we have. And then I think um, I'm always awed by how you manage uh, an audience, no matter, let me not get into the stories, but you are an expert at speaking. Right, and I think uh, it's never a waste of time. Uh, it's proper value for the unit of time someone spends listening to you, and Thank you deserve you all the accolades. Thank you. Thank so you. So, for our audience, how can people reach you for speaking engagements? The, if you want to engage with me, and you want me to engage back, LinkedIn is the place. Direct. Ah, I love that platform. Thank LinkedIn, you. Wale Akiemi. LinkedIn, reach out to me. I will get back to you. Thank you. Yes, faster than email because email may go through yes, yes, yes. other people. This other one, procedures. I deal with it myself. Directly. Yes. Thank you, Dr. Wale, for making time for us. Thank you. I had fun. I, I hope I've, 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 I added value. The pleasure was mine. <laughs> and I believe the sentiments, uh, and I believe I, that experience is shared by our audience too. Um, thank you. Thank you.